Well, welcome everybody to the final uh, the event of the, the uh, fall lecture series. Um, first off, I'd like to thank uh, the University of Idaho, uh, Montana State University, and uh, the Integrated Design Lab Network. Um, if you haven't already done so, um, please sign in. And also, there's a secondary sign in for uh, AIA credits. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, as, as per usual, um, those watching online can sign in and um, email us with questions. We can, we can relay those to David. Uh, well, he can answer them at the end. Uh, the email is idl at uidaho.edu. Um, and leads me to our speaker tonight, David Goldberg from uh, Methuen in Seattle. Uh, David uh, graduated from the University of Virginia with an undergraduate in architecture, um, and then graduated from the University of Washington as, as a master of architecture. Uh, has been working for Methuen since then. Um, he is a managing director and on the board for Methune, and <clears throat> has, is the lead designer for several projects such as uh, the Islandwood um, uh, Environmental School, uh, Teton Science School, the um, expansion of the Seattle Aquarium, and uh, serves on several boards including he was a co-founder of the Seattle Climate Partnership and on the board for the Woodland Park Zoo. Um, with that, David? Take it away. Thanks a bunch. Um, I just have a quick question. Should I stay over on this side? That works? OK, super. Thanks, everyone, for having me. Uh, this is the most time I've ever spent in Boise. So far, it's been great. And so I really appreciate uh, um, the IDL inviting me out here for this and for the university's participation as well. Um, I'm just going to start off. I'm going to tell folks uh, I was asked to talk a little bit about a uh, low-tech design. <laughs> So uh, I, I think a lot of our projects are low tech. A lot of our projects are low tech and they're high tech because you kind of need to, to get to the goals that we're all trying to face here in the 21st century. Um, it takes all sorts of solutions, but the low tech ones are the ones we like to start with first. A lot of back to basics design approaches, which many of you are probably familiar with. Um, and a lot of help is provided in Seattle as well as here in Boise by the Integrated Design Lab in um, helping us kind of do the math and the science behind those kinds of solutions. Um, so the stuff that used to be kind of rule of thumb, uh, the, way it's, the way you got to prove that it actually works is uh, through the science side and by having experts that can help you. So um, anyway, I'm going to start off by just talking a little bit about Methune, uh, a little bit about what we do, our mission, and uh, why we do the work that we do and why we do it the way that we do it, and then go through a series of case studies um, that get at this topic. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, Methune, we're, uh, we're based in Seattle, down here at, a, you have a pointer here somewhere, down near Pier 56 on the waterfront in Seattle. If you're ever down in Seattle sometime taking the ferry, uh, come visit. The ferry stops a couple doors away from us. Uh, we also have an office that we opened last year downtown in San Francisco on Market Street. Uh, we do a decent amount of work down in the California um, market area as well. Um, our mission at Methune, is to inspire a sustainable world. And the way we want to do that is through leadership, through innovation, and through integrated design. And integrated design is a real big deal for us. And I think that's an important uh, phrase in there. It's a catchphrase that you hear a lot about now, but it's something that we've focused a, a lot of energy and attention on over the last 10 years at Methune. Um, so much so that we just wrote a book called Integrated Design. There's a picture of someone with lovely hands um, reading the book. I, I owe a copy to the lab here. I'll bring you guys one. Uh, it was published uh, by Ecotone Publishing. Uh, David McCauley was the author. And it talks a lot about our, uh, how, how we're approaching integrated design and what it means to Methune. As a, we get in a lot of discussions whether integrated design is a, a verb or a noun. Uh, I believe it's both. And um, we're uh, very passionate about this subject. Uh, in writing the book, our, the author asked us what, what, our, uh, what our guiding design principles were at Methune. And we didn't actually have them written down at that time, but we intuitively knew what they were. So we had a little design charrette, and we, um, we solidified them as such. Um, and we have seven of them. We always like to have odd numbers of these things. It works a lot better than even numbers. So there's always seven or five. In this case, it was seven guiding design principles for our work. Um, the first was about growing an idea, which is basically making sure our work is conceptually driven, conceptually strong design work. 
Um, and that's the genesis of any idea as a concept. That concept can be rooted in community, uh, rooted in issues of the environment, rooted in sense of place, can be rooted in a lot of different places, ideally in all of those things coming together, but conceptually driven design. Um, strengthening community is an important uh, part of our practice and all the work we do. Um, that can be by the projects that we choose to do and also can be in, in the implementation of those projects at an urban design scale or as small as at the individual building scale. Um, using nature as a guide, uh, listening to the land, listening to the forces of mother nature and the earth and helping that shape our designs. So as opposed to coming up with great ideas and then fighting mother nature and figuring out how to how we can do what we want to do in spite of Mother Nature. <laughs> uh, we'd like to use nature as our guide. Um, doing the math, we talked about that a little bit, but um, uh, trying to, to get to the scientific facts behind um, uh, the performance of our designs now um, and have that actually drive the decisions. This is a tricky thing, and there's still a lot of work to be done in this area. I know the Integrated Design Lab's working a lot on post-occupancy evaluations right now. We are as well. But actually getting so, so much of design over the last, in the 1900s, which sounds like a really long time ago when you say it that way, um, so much of that old design work really wasn't done by doing the math. Um, the math might not ever have been done. Uh, codes have forced us to do a little bit of math. But actually trying to understand if we change the building orientation, how does that actually change the performance of a of a building, um, uh, if we uh, change, the, change the windows, if we um, change the shape of the roof, if we implement some of these low-tech design strategies, how does that impact performance? Um, finding engineers that can work with a design team at the early, part of the early part of the design process to help us do the math, that's challenging, um, as well as finding the fee to do it, finding clients that support that approach. You guys all know that a lot of these challenges are, but this is definitely the direction that um, design needs to be headed. Uh, integrated design only works if you leave your ego at the door and work in a, we believe, in a more collaborative fashion because you're trying to get lots of experts to get their ideas on the table at the beginning of a process. And we really need to be good listeners and I'd say, I'm an architect. Um, architects aren't typically known as being great listeners and they're not typically known to leave their egos at the door either. And so that, but that's a really important uh, part of our practice. Uh, Creating beauty and spirit. I'm going to talk a lot about that today because ultimately, um, uh, uh, building or uh, a city can perform as efficiently as you want it to. But if it's not loved and cherished by a community and by the users, no one's going to really want to take care of it over time. And it's certainly not going to be a sustainable solution. It's really the most important thing in a lot of ways. Um, and ultimately, expanding the boundaries. And that can be expanding the boundaries physically of uh, when we look at a project. So often, where people's tendency is to just look at the, the property, at the property line of a project and stop right there. But uh, moving way out in scale and understanding the impact of this site uh, within a greater ecosystem. Um, and it's not just physically expanding the boundaries, it's also expanding the boundaries of our minds and how we think about projects and how we approach them. And so that's a pretty loose term. Um, I pulled these slides up from a talk I did at, uh, in Pullman a few years ago. I was trying to talk with the architecture students there about the uh, changing world of design and integrated design and talked about the old model. I had lots of great images of all these architects from the 1900s, the, the big, I just went online and found about 20 pictures of classic architect pictures. They're all standing there with their hands up in the air, looking tough, looking cool. Um, kind of the all-knowing, suave, uh, uh, genius architect. So this is kind of the old model, um, how, how projects <laughs> run. And they still run this way in some cases. Uh, but we believe that there's a new model out there, um, which is the team gathers, a team of experts gather around the project. The experts include the client, they include the contractor. You guys all know about all this. But what I do think is important to note is that the, I still do believe, and this is what I was trying to tell the students up at WSU, is that there still is a tremendous role, I believe, for the, um, for the architect as a leader in that process, as a, um, as um, having enough knowledge about the different areas and being a creative problem solver and to be an inspirational leader to bring together um, diverse points of view and diverse disciplines um, to help come up with creative uh, design solutions. And so I do believe that while some architects are kind of scared at the notion or think that it's kind of a lame approach to have an integrated design process where the engineer gets to speak up at the beginning and the contractor and that they might actually have good ideas, um, if you can leave your ego at the door and actually listen, you never know where the great ideas come from. And um, it's important. But I do believe the architect has a very valuable role in being able to assimilate those ideas 
and pull them together and create a, a beautiful project out of it. Um, focusing in on energy conservation, um, I guess this is an appropriate slide for today. You all probably know there's big talks going on in Copenhagen right now. There's, uh, I don't know, 12,000 people there or something like that, uh, all having these giant meetings trying to come to some global treaty uh, around carbon uh, emissions and climate policy. Um, but we did, basically, you know, we've got, we've got the line in the middle, the carbon neutral line. We have the emissions and the, this whole kind of controversial aspect, uh, issue of offsets and how we're going to deal with the emissions that are, we're always going to have some emissions um, and how are we going to offset those or how are we going to have some buildings that are actually regenerative and are um, sequestering more carbon than they're creating. So anyway, this is just kind of a graphic to help us think about that issue. Um, the the three-step approach that we are advocates at Methune about is a three-step approach. starts with reduction. And that's what most of today's talk is supposed to be about, about load reduction. So the first thing is reduction, like this project down in Arizona. Um, uh, the, the heavy masonry walls, in this case, they're actually rammed earth walls in the Arizona desert. Um, the thermal mass on the buildings helping to reduce the uh, energy demand in the operations of that building. It's a low-tech solution. Um, it's a solution that uh, reduces the demand on all the mechanical systems in the building. There's all sorts of strategies, which we'll talk about today, of reducing. But reducing is number one. Um, number two is renewables. Um, uh, in this case, this project, which we'll talk a little bit about more later, but photovoltaic, solar hot water panels, finding renewable sources of energy. I heard that you guys actually have some pretty cool geothermal sources here in town, so I'm a little bit jealous. Uh, I thought I had to go all the way to Iceland for that. I didn't realize it was just here in Boise. So um, in any case, uh, but the next step after, after reducing loads as much as possible, which can really slice a huge amount off the pie, uh, moving into uh, finding sources of renewable energy, whether it's through your utility and purchasing green power, um, or whether it's actually um, through the project. And then the last step is the offset, we believe. And um, I know it's controversial in the design community to consider offsets, um, but once you've reduced what you can reduce, and once you've um, gotten as much renewables as you can into a project or into a building, um, it, is a, it is a valid approach, um, we believe, to uh, offset remaining emissions. Um, this cow right here is our buddy at Methune. We've been members of the Chicago Climate Exchange. Uh, we were the first design firm to do that about five, six years ago or so. And uh, we've been offsetting all of our um, carbon emissions that we calculate on an annual basis. They've been working with us to try to help find kind of local projects. In this case, we we're actually able to uh, get in on a project in the Sk Skagit Valley where they're recovering methane from this guy right here. So I don't think it was actually this cow. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, there's a lot of different carbon offset projects on there. Please do your research before you uh, buy into any of them because there's kind of a, a wide range of um, caliber of those projects and quality. Um, so now I'm going to jump right in and just talk about load reduction strategies. Um, first I wanted to talk about, and this is just a real quickie to talk about some of the R&D work that we do at Methune. This is one of our projects called Build Carbon Neutral. Most of today's talk I'm going to focus in on the building operations and how to reduce loads there. Um, studies show different amounts, but in approximate terms about 15 to 20 percent of the embodied greenhouse gas emissions in any project are in the construction of the project. So most of us have spent our energy, like the IDL here, on focusing on the activities after construction, the life of the building, 20 to 50 to 100 years, whatever that is, where the 80 to 85% of the carbon emissions in energy use live. But we noticed at Methune, and we do this a lot at Methune, where we notice that there's a void somewhere and there's questions that nobody's answering. We were trying to get to the bottom of how do you make smart design decisions about um, that first 15 to 20 percent. So we worked with the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center out of Austin, Texas, and we also worked with um, some local contractors to do some rough order magnitude calculation. There's this online source called Build Carbon Neutral. You can go on there. Um, it's a free public website, and in a very quick period of time, you can actually, uh, just in about 15, 20 minutes, if you have a basic project, you can get a rough order magnitude guess at what the embodied carbon emissions are in the construction of that project. Um, so that's, that's one way to reduce loads of, inter, of embodied energy use in a project. Uh, the other one, at a much, much larger scale, so I went from the micro to the macro, is actually looking at our urban design solutions and smart growth and development. Uh, this diagram right here talks, is, uh, comes out of a project we call Reality Check, working with uh, local developers and leaders, um, politicians in the Seattle community, of planning out future growth up through 2040, so it was kind of a 35-year 
look at the Seattle region, trying to understand where different development could happen and different development patterns and what the associated energy use and carbon emission impact was of, of those strategies. This was the, the densest version of that plan, centered uh, mostly around transit-oriented developments. And in this scheme, uh, I believe, it says up at the top, we were saving about 23% uh, carbon over a, over a baseline strategy. But we're able through tools like Build Carbon Neutral and other similar tools, able to start understanding uh, the decisions we make and the impacts that those decisions around urban design, planning, um, and site selection, what impacts those have on kind of our greater greater issues. And so a lot of times, you know, we, we wish every project that we had at Methune was a, um, was a, a lead platinum building, uh, but that's not necessarily going to be the case um, with the wide range of clients that most firms work with. But we have, we, do, we have set parameters to make sure everything we're doing fits within our mission. So we will take projects on, um, especially mixed-use developer-driven projects, we'll take them on as long as they're within the urban growth boundary, as long as they're focused on transit-oriented development. Uh, because that's the biggest impact we can make beyond all the individual energy performance of that building, which we'll do as best as we can within the budgets and the parameters um, of that given project and that given client. But if we can do those projects and help support people living close to where they're working, um, close to uh, uh, transit system, public transit systems, we're having a tremendous impact on um, overall carbon emissions and energy consumption in a community. Now I'm going to jump in and talk about some individual case studies of projects. Uh, many of which we actually worked with with the IDL in Seattle on. So we get to sh um, kind of share some of those stories. First one's called Zoomasium, uh, which is a building up at Woodland Park Zoo. Um, these little guys, I don't know if we had them locked out for the picture just because they look cute or what, but that's, that's the special kid entry to Zoomasium. That picture's there just to share with you that it's a uh, kid-focused project at the zoo. It's supposed to be a fun project. Basically, it's a flexible, open, indoor play space for kids. Um, at Woodland Park Zoo. It's about an 8,300 square foot building. And I'm going to let you know, this project I know a lot about because I was intimately involved in it. I know most of the projects pretty well that I'll talk about today. Some of them I don't know as many of the details on because I wasn't directly on the project team. So I'll answer. Please jump in with questions anytime you want. Um, happy to do it that way. Uh, if I know the answer, I'll, I'll tell you. If I don't know it, I'm not going to make it up. <laughs> but I do promise I can get you the answer um, later uh, through folks back at the office. So in any case, this is a project working on a number of years ago, probably about five years ago or so at Methune, Woodland Park Zoo. It's up near Green Lake in Seattle, north part of Seattle. Uh, Woodland Park Zoo is a 92-acre site. Um, here's a look, uh, zooming in on Zoomasium. It used to be called the Family Science Learning Center, and then they thought that name wasn't fun enough for kids, so they changed it. In any case, it's a part of a complex here uh, called Discovery Village, the first building of a complex here that would include um, conservation uh, exhibit building and a building that's showing the different biomes of the world. In any case, uh, set within a pretty forested area and set on the, on the site of the old primate house at the zoo, which is an old building, kind of the old school primate house with monkeys behind bars. Hadn't used it in years, and so they ripped that building down. This was built on the same footprint. And you see here, it's a very, very simple diagram of a space. Um, one big flexible exhibit hall and um, some support, some administrative support spaces. And one big goal we have at Methune is to make, our, our goal is to listen to all those natural forces like we talked about, and also to have the buildings and the designs express the environmental um, intent of the project. So we work real hard to simplify the diagrams of these buildings so that not only are they the best performing, but that someone can go there and actually kind of comprehend the design approach and the conceptual approach to the project. Uh, many exhibit spaces at zoos and other institutions are done uh, they aren't really thinking about flexibility, so they build exhibits. Five years later, when everything gets out of date, they get stuck with an outdated exhibit. You've all seen these things. Then they have to rip them all down 20 years later and go build a new one. So our goal was to help them create a very beautiful, well-daylit, well-ventilated space that would serve their needs in the short term, but also would be a flexible space that they could use in a multitude of ways uh, over the lifetime of the building. Um, so we situated this main exhibit space. It's about 5,000 square feet. Um, and as well as this administrative area to the right. Um, we developed a, a section through the building uh, focus, uh, focusing on uh, natural ventilation. This building is actually a mixed mode building. Uh, we were working with Flack and Kurtz engineers out of Seattle. We did some, uh, 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 some ventilation modeling on the project and determined that the zoo has, you have to think a lot about this in these low-tech solutions, the zoo has its uh, highest use during the summer months that happens to be when it's the hottest in Seattle. And so when they started cranking numbers in this exhibit space, having uh, 
uh, high occupancy for many hours of the day during the hottest months of the season, we were starting to get temperatures in this main space that were getting real high uh, above the threshold, even with really smart uh, natural ventilation and cross ventilation strategies. So this is a mixed mode system where we do have air conditioning and we do have natural uh, cooling uh, during other parts of the year. And the system's smart, so it can actually switch between those two. Um, but anyway, a, a large, uh, a good section to allow for cross ventilation, low windows, high windows, um, as well as uh, we'll talk a little bit more later about uh, the green roof. It's a real deep green roof, six inches of soil, provides a heck of a lot of insulation for this building, as well as the office areas, keeping all those spaces shallow enough that we can have single-sided daylighting work effectively um, with the addition of some skylights that the IDL helped us strategically locate, as well as um, single-sided ventilation in these spaces because we weren't able to get windows on two sides of the offices. Yes? in the picture. Yeah, um, south, we're, we're actually, this is actually part of the story, and I should go back here. I should have talked about that right here. Um, this, that section was cut horizontally through this plan. So south is down. South is the bottom of the page on this plan. And um, so essentially, we're not actually, we're, it's a, to a large degree, a cooling dominated space. That's where we're having most of our problems. And so we were, we were not trying to, get too much direct southern light into the space. The tricky thing is it set us up with a western exposure, a big wall and windows here, uh, with a western exposure. And I'll show you how we dealt with that. And I think that's actually part of the story here that's real important. We had a little bit of solar glazing to the south uh, right down here. And we'll talk about that as well. And I think actually a story, you can see a few west facing buildings here. This, in Seattle, we run into this all, all the time because a lot of the beautiful views are to the west. That's not why this building orients west. It was for other reasons. It was a very constrained site at the zoo, and we really had no choice but to orient that direction. In many cases, we run into the primary views in Seattle. People buy an expensive piece of property, and they, they want those gorgeous views of the Olympic Mountains. And so uh, Kevin probably remembers that from his days working in Seattle. You end up with a lot of west-facing projects that have to deal with um, uh, that uh, heat gain issue as well as the daylighting issue, which can be really challenging. Um, working with the lighting lab, the cool thing we were able to do is uh, we knew there were a lot of trees to the west of the site. It was actually a forested site. And we knew it wouldn't be fair to model the building in such a way without taking advantage of those trees. So we actually took a photograph of those trees, copied it onto mylar, you see to the right-hand side of the image right there, um, and mounted it there so that we could actually uh, model the inside of the building from a daylight strategy. This is looking inside of the model, which is almost exactly what the building looks like today. And looking through there, you got a pretty good sense of the density of the forest that was there. Um, in fact, a lot of the leaves were off. So this is actually kind of more of the worst case scenario because of the winter time. Um, but in any case, we were able to model the space with the lighting lab and take advantage of those. And so we actually found out that the west facing issue wasn't such a, a big issue. And subsequently, um, we determined that the zoo had a big issue with um, birds uh, flying into glass at a lot of their exhibits and dying. <laughs> which wasn't a real great thing for the zoo to have a whole bunch of birds getting killed. And um, so they were interested in exploring ways. We were going to create a very kind of naturalistic play space set right up against the trees where the whole sorts of birds. So birds would be very attracted to go and go fly right in there. And so the zoo was interested in experimenting with some technologies to see how they could prevent um, bird fatalities on their glazing. Uh, it turns out there's a guy back east in Pittsburgh who's actually, I think, in Pennsylvania doing research on this issue. He was actually in the, setting up little experiments in the woods and um, with pieces of glass and different kinds of glass and seeing, I don't know how exactly I was doing, see how many birds flew into these things and were getting killed. Um, but interestingly enough, you know, the, the big issue is about cutting down the reflectivity of the glass on the outside. So we actually ended up using a, um, a fritted glass pattern on all the glass at the zoo. So not only did the fritted glass actually help reduce the um, reflectivity of the glass um, and prevent um, bird strikes, but it also helped prevent some of the heat gain in some of the areas in the space. So it's a kind of a higher performing uh, building as a result. And it's actually worked really well. They haven't had any f bird fatalities that they've been able to find outside these big windows. And so it's uh, been a pretty decent success story. Um, here's a look at the building. You can actually just barely tell in the images that the, the glass has a little bit of a kind of a milky white pattern to it. And that's uh, from the white um, ceramic fritz on the glazing. Um, so here's a looking at that west elevation up against the trees on the right-hand side of the page. You can see the operable windows high, the operable windows low. You can see these big curving trusses uh, holding up the vegetated roof. 
Um, working with the lighting lab, we did discover that on the south side of the building, we did have some um, daylight penetration that was actually uh, gonna cause some problems. Exhibit designers hate daylight. And that was the other part of the big success story. They just absolutely hate daylight. They want a black box, typically. But we thought that was a real short-sighted way to design this building because in the future, if you're doing something else in there, a good daylight building, you could never, no one was gonna add windows to the building later. So we, um, we actually had to add some horizontal sunscreens here. And here you can see um, actually the fritted glass pattern and certain kinds of light, you can barely see through it. Um, but from the other direction, looking back out, you can see out just fine. Um, so you can see how we uh, uh, dealt with the south elevation in this case. Um, this is a shot before all the exhibits went. It's amazing, it's uh, got a raised access floor. Um, so all the ventilation comes through the floor. It's a very flexible space. Um, and looking out in the trees, you can see it looks a lot like that daylighting model, actually. It's kind, of, it's kind of amazing. That's the other great thing about modeling your building physically. It forces designers to build a physical model of the space at a large scale at an early stage of the process. And even if you don't learn that much about the lighting, you learn so much about the building. It's, it's, really, it's really a valuable tool. It's very rare that we get to get up at that scale with a physical model. Um, but you can see these are the kinds of, this is what the space looks like now inside. They've got exhibits going on in there. They're doing shows. Um, you can see back in the distance some of the views out into the trees. Uh, that mountain in the distance, isn't, that's a projection that they change. Uh, with, so there's a lot of technology in this space. And believe it or not, the exhibit designers were pleased. They didn't think it was going to work. They thought there was going to be too much daylight in the space, and none of their projections were going to work, and the technology wasn't going to be successful. But they were able to make it really successful, and they have a beautifully daylit space. Um, it has a really great light quality, you can tell in this picture. And uh, so it's, a, I think, a real big success. Uh, the other cool thing, which is a, I don't want to call it a low-tech solution, but it is a passive solution, was the, the vegetated roof. This being Woodland Park Zoo, um, they have a tremendous horticulture program there. Uh, we had came up with a concept of actually recreating the forest floor, a native forest floor on the roof of the building. So this isn't just a green roof with some little sedums on it. This is actually a native northwest forest floor. Uh, I believe it has 22,000 plants up on the roof, and these guys are just starting to put them in there. The local soil being on the rooftop and having just fill and how there's been a really problem with that? Um, well, the question is about the soil and uh, whether we were able to use local soil. I know the soil was engineered. It has to be engineered to a certain degree because it's got to be a real lightweight soil and it's got to drain, it's got to drain well into the, the green roof system. The soil wasn't from the site specifically. And I know that I think the issue that you're talking about comes around um, whether you have to add uh, compost to the soil on a right, whether there's enough nutrients in the soil to support the native species. We haven't had issues there that I know about. I could find out more if you want with our landscape architects in the house. Um, you can see here, you can get a sense of the green roof. The cool thing is that it uh, changes seasonally. Uh, so it'll go brown in the summertime, goes green, different plants come into bloom. Um, there's some lupin here, I think. So this is in the, this must be in the springtime, I believe. So um, in any case, it's a pretty rich environment and it creates a lot of habitat up there on the roof of the building. So anyway, that was a pretty cool story. Um, the other part of, here it is in a different season actually, um, the local utilities actually doing a lot of testing on this roof, metering how much water actually comes off it. They're doing this around town in different uh, green roof settings so they can actually start getting some of the, doing some of the math around these solutions and see how much water is actually being retained in different seasons. That's an ongoing uh, study. Next project I'm going to talk about is called the Yesler Community Center. Um, this is located in Seattle uh, in a very urban neighborhood right along uh, right near I-5 in the International District 990, a very ethnically diverse neighborhood. Um, here's a picture of the building in its uh, finished state. Um, it's a, I can't remember exactly how big, probably about a 12,000 square foot community center, done on a very reasonable city of, or not, I shouldn't call it reasonable, a tight budget. And so this, uh, one of, I think, the great stories here is this building, I think, had a 160 or $170 a square foot budget, was able to achieve a, a very high uh, LEED gold rating. The zoo building as well as a LEED gold certified building, the first one in any zoo in the world that um, got a LEED, a LEED gold rating. Um, this community center got a, a real high score as well in the LEED system. Um, a lot of work in this project of thinking about how different spaces in the program were oriented um, to allow for um, passive ventilation strategies. There was no air conditioning in this building. Um, as well as to allow for um, daylighting access to all the primary usable spaces. Um, so you can see here a map of the, the daylight factor. Um, the big space on the right, number six, is the gymnasium. 
which I'll talk about in more detail. And space number seven, which you'll see over here is a multi-purpose room, which I'll talk about in more detail as well. You can see the plan split apart um, to create more surface area so we could get more uh, daylight into, into key spaces as well as to create different heights of buildings so that we could get the ventilation to work um, through clear story windows so we have low windows, high windows, and to get all these systems working together. Um, there's a look uh, looking from uh, east, uh, looking from west to east down the main space. You can see the high clear story windows uh, which are operated. You can see a bar up there on the right, up on the, where I'm pointing right there. That's the window operating bar. So there's an um, automatic system that opens up all the windows when the space needs to cool, close them down when it needs to warm up. Uh, so you can see it works for daylighting. No, 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 I think some of the lights are in this picture. That's a problem. The architectural photographers always want the lights on in the pictures, but they don't sometimes help us tell the stories that we want to tell. <laughs> it's a very well daylit space. Um, this is looking in one of the multi-purpose rooms. Uh, this face is due south. Uh, also has big views of Mount Rainier. Um, there's a... a there's solar shading on the outside to cut down on the direct solar penetration in the space. And you can see the daylight up on the upper right-hand part of the picture with the operable windows. So we're getting cross ventilation. We're also getting a well-balanced uh, daylit space on two sides. Um, look, thinking, uh, looking at the gymnasium, a lot of effort went in the gymnasium. The Seattle Parks Department had done some daylit gymnasiums uh, in the 1960s and 1970s. They thought they were terrible disasters. <laughs> From a lighting standpoint, and they leaked, and you know, so there's a lot of kind of bad feelings about doing a daylit gym. Um, one of the principals at our office who led this project was uh, he was really, really, really uh, dedicated to trying to make this happen and trying to prove that we could do it effectively um, through working with the Integrated Design Lab and our mechanical engineers and our electrical engineers. We were actually able to um, create a space that worked for ventilation, as you see in this picture, and also with a series of daylight monitors up on the top that are controlled. Um, in order to get daylight into the space, but no direct daylight, so it's not, um, we're not impacting kind of a visual play of sports, basketball and volleyball, different things going on there. Um, here's a picture in the gymnasium. Um, here you can see the lights are off in the space. This is, a, this is actually summertime, I believe, but real late in the day. This is probably like 7 o'clock. This is kind of an hour after work volleyball game. You can see the daylight quality in the space. It's actually a really pleasant light quality. So it's not just about saving energy, but the light quality is actually so much better. Uh, it feels, feels like you're outdoors. Um, and here's a picture of our, of our team here playing. Um, and you can get a sense of the skylights up above and the visual quality of the light in the space. The lights are off in this picture. And uh, so you see it's a real big success story. And I believe the Parks Department's actually changed this to their standard protocol. Uh, for how they want to do gyms in the future because it's working so well. So it was, a, it was a good success story. Yeah, question. Yeah, the center clear story looked like it had a north-facing window, but the others didn't in that section you showed. Go back and see. I assume the other one would facing south. Yeah, I assume the other one Yeah, the two are facing south, and I'm not quite sure why the one has the, in that diagram, I'm not sure why it has a, a double-facing north and south skylights. I don't know the story there. I do know that those were changed and value engineered about six times <laughs> during the course of the project, <laughs> but they somehow or another survived, so they kept kind of getting downgraded to simpler and simpler systems. Kevin might remember because he worked on this project. I actually remember uh, the, the, north, the, the center skylight is north and south for increased daylight in the middle because uh, it doesn't have the walls to reflect and whatnot, uh, and it's also about additional ventilation capacity. Uh, there was a lot of back and forth between the daylighting lab and Thune, and, and it was uh, keen at the time, right? Stantec. <coughs> yeah, Stantec Engineering now, yeah. yeah. About all the daylighting and, and ventilation integration. Yeah, it does make sense. I'm, and I'm guessing the, the IDL uh, wanted us to paint all the walls white inside, would have been my guess too, perhaps. <laughs> and we, sometimes we fight that one, so we, we don't always listen. But in this project, I think we listened a lot, and that's why it's such a successful uh, project. It's just raw CMU. A um, um, uh, project to talk about now, this is a project that's in design right now, uh, and this project's in a different part of the country. This is in southeastern Kentucky. It's called Riverwoods. It's a residential environmental education center. So always fun for us when we get to work in new locales. Um, a lot of people say that you, you really need to live in a place to know how to design that place. Sometimes I believe that's true, but I also believe sometimes when you come in with a fresh kind of perspective of an outsider, you see things a little bit more clearly, and you can sometimes uh, learn and ask more questions. There are certain things that people take for granted that we can question, 
and actually uh, push designs a little further and understand a sense of place. So it's always fun as we do work in other places. We have a pretty balanced portfolio between work that's local and work at a national level. Anyway, southeastern Kentucky is certainly a, a heck of a lot different than uh, the Pacific Northwest in a lot of ways. <laughs> in any case, this is our original concept diagram for the project. It's a site, uh, you can see the red X on the map down there, located along the Cumberland River, uh, which is part of the Mississippi River watershed. And uh, so there are big educational goals on this project about trying to connect little kids in a very rural, very poor community um, and help them understand the impact of the decisions that they make on other living things and other ecosystems uh, much grander all the way to the to the dolphins you see in the picture on the on the left in the Gulf of Mexico uh, down the lower uh, left hand part of the page and this is sometimes we start projects just kind of with an idea a, dry, a, dr a drawing like this to kind of help get the client excited and get our design team to have some inspiration for moving forward um, here's a picture of the site it's in Cumberland Falls State Park for anyone right along right near the Tennessee border um, right along the Cumberland River, which you see on the bottom part of the project, and surrounded by the Daniel Boone National Forest, and right next door to the home of Colonel Sanders, Corbin, Kentucky, the first KFC in America. So uh, all sorts of great culture here in this project. Um, this is an aerial view looking at a rendering. Like I said, this project is at the end of DD. It's actually on hold right now awaiting funding. Um, and the reason I wanted to talk about this one, uh, this is a series of small buildings in a real rural setting. And just to talk about the subject of different approaches for different programmatic uses within a project. This being a residential environmental education center. Um, so let me get my mouse back here. Um, there's, a, there's an office component. There's a classroom component. Uh, there's a residential component. So there's some lodges as well as a dining hall. And I'm going to talk about three of those right here and different strategies we used for the different buildings based on their different programmatic uses. That's the lowest tech thing you can do <laughs> is really get to the bottom of the different uses and understanding how to design the buildings accordingly in relation to the site. This is a floor plan of the dining hall building. Uh, the dining hall building had an open kind of cafeteria dining area over here on the left hand side um, and also had um, a gathering function here. The gathering space was mostly kind of an auditorium space like this where they really didn't want too much daylight in the space most of the time, mostly uh, around more formal presentations, either on the stage or video screen. That's why we set this, this part of the building back in the woods and weren't actually trying to access daylight. The section I'll show you in a minute uh, actually slices through the dining hall and talks about our strategy for getting daylight um, into that space. It faces um, south, southwest, uh, a lot of trees on the site as well. Um, here's a section that shows some of the low-tech and a few of the, I guess, higher-tech strategies. Uh, we did uh, look to geothermal heating and cooling for a lot of these buildings, um, with the exception of one, which is a living building target, so we couldn't have any, uh, any cooling in the building to make it work. Uh, it's pretty humid there in the summertime in southeastern Kentucky, and you also need a lot of screens on the windows. There are a lot of issues with uh, natural cooling there. Um, so in most of the cases, you can see here in the diagram, you can just barely see um, where we are facing mostly south, but we have a big overhang on the roof. The concept of this building was that it felt like you were kind of under the canopy of the trees with this large exposed roof. Um, but we're bringing in southern light uh, from the left here. Uh, we're blocking a lot of it with this big roof overhang, and then we're blocking the rest of it uh, with a light shelf that's bouncing other daylight back into this open cafeteria space. Pretty simple stuff. Um, getting the building up in the air so we could distribute air um, uh, horizontally across uh, through this plenum throughout the whole space. And uh, real quickly, give you a view of the kind of schematic design, conceptual drawing of this space. The color's a little vibrant. <laughs> in the, in the, at least have, your projector looks different than my screen. So um, this is kind of a psychedelic version. Uh, in any case, you can get a sense of that building. It didn't, uh, when it, the, the concept was to for have that be a real glazed box. As we started working through our uh, our actual energy models, we realized we couldn't have that much glazing. We also couldn't afford it. Surprise, surprise. Um, you know, so we ended up uh, with uh, reduced glazing, a lot less glazing than shown in this picture, and high performance glazing um, where we have it. And um, so you can get a sense of how this space works. It's a really simple, open, flexible volume, just with a smart daylighting and a smart air control, as well as doing lots of other good stuff, like uh, capturing rainwater and reusing it in some gardens nearby. Um, the next building I talk about is the uh, classroom building. This is the one that's actually targeting the living building challenge. Um, uh, the diagram for the buildings over here on the left, you see here um, these power lines. Uh, 
it just so happens that our living building was sited right where um, power transmission lines run right through the middle of the site. And so we thought it would be really poignant actually in a lot of ways to uh, put the building right there in that easement. So what's in the drawings right now in the plan is that the building will actually sit right on top of that easement. We think we have permission to do that. And the power lines will go and actually dip underground before they get to the building, kind of uh, symbolically showing that this building doesn't need the power. Um, so it's kind of the uh, new technology sitting on top of the old uh, 1900s technology. And so we wanted to kind of have that message be loud and clear for the thousands of kids that would come through this center every year. Um, so you see here in the diagram that the, up on the upper left, you can't see the mouse here, but um, that, the, uh, that the building is sited right along the power line easement. The power line easement happens to run east-west, so it's perfect orientation for our building. Get a nice narrow building, nice narrow footprint. Um, we've actually split the classrooms apart in this project. Here's a floor plan. Um, in order to maximize cross ventilation in these spaces, because uh, the summer months are going to be challenging. So, we actually have uh, exterior kind of uh, circulation between these classrooms um, with these vestibule spaces where big doors can be slid open. So, in the summertime, these can function as kind of four with four exterior walls in each of the classroom spaces. So, we can get cross ventilation um, through these spaces as well as through each of the classrooms. So, it's a very simple de design. There's four classrooms. Um, two toilet rooms that are composting toilets because we have to be essentially net zero in water use and in energy use uh, for the buildings. Uh, people were still concerned about comfort in the summertime in these spaces. And so we're actually working uh, with our engineers who are based out of Louisville, Kentucky. Um, and they were working real hard and trying to model um, what we called, uh, I think we called them air tubes, or earth tubes is what we call them. So the idea is to actually bring from the north side of the building, get my mouse back here, from the north side of the building on the forested side where we have a lot of shade and the temperatures would be a little bit cooler because of the vegetation, because of the shade, uh, that we'd be able to bring air um, through an underground tube, pull it up into the space and be able to deliver some relatively cool air during the most hot and humid months into the space. Uh, we'll have to use some fans to do this, um, but the roof is loaded with photovoltaics as uh, well as uh, the hope to do a wind turbine out on the site. So um, this is how we're, we think we're t on target to achieve a, a living building rating with this project. We can see a lot of low-tech solutions. Here's a, here's a look at the south face of the building. Um, so it's a tricky balance here because we need, we need lots of glazing in order to get passive, we need to get passive heating in the wintertime. It'll snow there and get pretty cold uh, as well as to get the cooling to work in the summertime. So trying to get that balance to work. I wouldn't be surprised, we fought a lot about the roof overhang on this building and whether we should be shading windows or not. I wouldn't be surprised in the next stage of development if we end up having to have some uh, kind of retractable awnings or something like that to help deal with that on a seasonal cycle basis to deal with the sun on the south elevation. Um, next buildings there I want to talk about are the, uh, the lodges. So these are the nighttime, uh, the interesting thing about lodges is that they're typically just nighttime use when they're going to be occupied. Kids and students are all going to be out in the field or in classrooms. Yeah, Kevin. Before you move on, I just was curious as, your, uh, as a designer, I really value your design sensibilities. How do you feel about these little wind, these wind towers as an idea? What do you know about them in terms of their viability? Uh, well, we're, well, viability is a huge question, first of all. We, we actually have a little weather station set up on site. <laughs> Um, so I recommend that on any project you can afford it for about 1500 bucks now you can get a pretty good weather station that you can set up if you have the luxury of having time to collect data because it's so hard to collect site specific data um, for the site. Um, jury's still out on whether it's going to be effective here and whether we have the right wind speeds. I think we're on slightly on the low side of sustained winds to make it work. Um, from an aesthetic standpoint, you know, for a project like this where they're trying to make a statement about kind of new technologies, emerging technology. I think it's a pretty powerful design statement to get a cool looking wind turbine out there or a series of micro turbines up on the building. Um, for a lot of projects, it doesn't make a lot of sense at all. For us, it was trying to, you can see the power line easement going off to the right hand side of the picture and disappearing over those hills. It's a due east-west line um, that just kind of cuts right through all these beautiful mountains. And so we thought it was a pretty important symbol in this project to have the wind turbine um, kind of take the place of that man-made swath right through this beautiful national forest. So that was a that was a good thing for us. I think in some other cases people might not find it appropriate. It's got to be client specific. 
Um, next uh, building, moving on to the lodges. Um, I can't remember how many, people, how many students we had in each lodge, but we split them up. And we had a, a different approach to the site here. We weren't really, <coughs> we weren't really um, dealing too much with um, taking advantage of sunlight. Um, uh, in the buildings, they're in a much more forested part of the site. We're trying to make them kind of super efficient, highly insulated buildings. These buildings get green roofs on them. Uh, they get the geothermal heat pump uh, once again. And um, it's really about creating a real well-insulated box that kind of box that kind of hunkers into the hillside. Um, you can take a look. This is kind of a fictitious view. You'd never really get this, but this kind of bird's eye view looking down the lodges. The other buildings that we talked about are all, we all, we look for south facing slopes across the site for all those other buildings. Um, these lodge buildings, we've scattered them in places uh, that aren't necessarily south facing. Um, so they're tucked into the trees, trying to create a more kind of magical experience for the user so that they feel like they're out in the woods. And we weren't really concerned with them kind of using the daylight in these spaces. Um, Next project I'm going to talk about is called the Teton Science School. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Um, uh, beautiful 200, well, it, yeah, about a 224-acre site in the town of Jackson, just, uh, just due west of the downtown uh, Jackson area. Um, <clears throat> an undeveloped site in a valley, deep at the bottom of a valley. You know, expensive real estate is in Sun Valley. It's even more expensive here, I think. <laughs> and um, so the science school had been around for about 30 years based in Teton National Park in a series of old lodges. They decided they were going to build their own K through 12 school, um, the first privately accredited independent school in the state of Wyoming. Um, and I believe they modeled it partially on some of the programs that are at a school in Sun Valley. Is there a well-known independent school there? The community, school. the community school. I think it's a fairly somewhat of a Similar program. These guys are very innovative in their uh, kind of education approach. In any case, um, very steep valley, about 500 foot hills on either side. Uh, but a pretty interesting diagram in a lot of ways. A, the diagram, which you guys are so familiar about, of having kind of two very distinct conditions on the site um, from the barren uh, sagebrush, exposed, sagebrush communities exposed uh, to the snow on the site for about six months out of the year. Um, the other issues we have is the uh, the really powerful diagram of the north facing slope versus the south facing slope. So the north facing slope with all the, the fir trees um, and pines uh, holds more moisture, the vegetation grows there, the south facing slope as you know is uh, on the left hand side of this image. And we, we were really interested in um, citing the buildings once again looking at the program. Um, this has some residential components, some lodges, also has a K through 12 school. Um, we wanted to or the buildings all had to go pretty much at the bottom of the valley just because of how steep these hills were. And what we were interested in doing is making sure that the buildings responded, the site diagram responded to the land, responded to wildlife patterns and migration patterns. There's a whole lot of issues at play here. Um, uh, but also that they responded to the use of the buildings. So in this case, very similar to the Riverwoods project, uh, we chose to put the two lodge buildings and another associated building um, on the side of the site that really wasn't going to get a lot of direct solar access. And we chose to put all the other buildings, um, the administration building, um, the maintenance building, the dining hall, as well as the K through 12 school on the other side of the valley with the roofs facing up where they could actually take advantage of um, the solar gain from the south. So a big goal in this was to have the buildings express those kind of natural forces of the site as well as the program. Uh, the building forms also came out of an understanding of the geology on the site turned out that one of the board members at the school was a, um, a geologist at the University of Utah. And he was able to help us understand the underlying geometry on the site, some of which was exposed, as you see here. And so all the roofs of the building kind of uh, were echoing, uh, these shed roofs were echoing the geometry of the site. They also worked real well. And we, didn't, we were working closely with the facilities guy there. We don't have a single roof um, that slopes down and drains over an entryway dealing with that whole swing season and the ice collecting at doorways. So real low maintenance, not a single cricket or valley in any of the roofs. So a real smart approach to snow design, I believe, as well. Uh, this is looking at the site plan. So you can see here at the bottom of the page, uh, the two lodges um, on the kind of, it's, the site's really at about a 45 degree angle, so it doesn't fit on a screen so well. But this is essentially the, the more southern side of the of the project, and these are on the, the south facing, but the more north side of the slope. Uh, with a big space for a play area in the middle, uh, there were some mule deer and elk migration patterns that happened through the middle of the site. 
Um, this is a look looking back down the valley. So we're actually looking kind of uh, west in this image, uh, looking at the dining hall building over on the right hand side, as well as some of the lodge buildings over on the left hand side. And where I wanted to focus in is on the school buildings, the K through 12 school. Um, they were cited in such a way for obvious reasons to, this is a very outdoor based curriculum, um, no gymnasium, they're out in the field, they're doing all project based learning around using the outdoors as their classroom. Um, and so uh, situating the classroom so that they all kind of looked out into the area that they'd be studying. So their classroom wasn't just the space that they were in, but was actually connected to the outdoors in a powerful way, as well as taking advantage of um, the solar gain, um, the daylighting from the south, um, as well as setting the buildings up for smart um, cross ventilation. And I think I have a, I'm not sure if I have a diagram coming up here in a second. The other thing is that the roofs on these buildings are all SIPS panels, super insulated. Um, and those are, that's actually all hardy panel stained, uh, not actually hardy plank, it's cementitious boards that are stained. That's the siding on the project. People always ask that question. This one's a little bit out of order. This is looking the other direction up the valley. Uh, this part I wanted to talk about a little bit more, um, working with Stantec engineers again in this case, um, who use a TAS or TAS modeling, thermal analysis software program out of uh, the UK where they were actually able, we weren't gonna have any air conditioning in these spaces, and they, they get some pretty warm temperatures in the summertime. Um, so we actually did studies on all the usable spaces, tested them in a, in a typical year during the schematic design and DD process, and were able through this chart to help predict what kind of temperatures we would expect in a typical year, just relying on the natural cooling in the building. And we were able to work, and the key is not just to do the study, but the key is to actually have enough budget with your engineers to actually have an iterative process of back and forth and back and forth so that we can find some spaces that aren't working and make appropriate design changes. Um, in this case, the addition, of, um, the addition of some solar shading to the project, some of which the owner cut out, but some of which they actually built, <laughs> and um, some reduction in some window sizes to reduce some heat gain in the summer months, and those kinds of things. So you know, the architect actually has to listen to the engineer <laughs> and early stage of the process to help shape the buildings. You know, what a novel concept. It's hard for us to do, but it really pays off uh, when it works. Um, this is, I want to focus in on the school buildings, a pretty non-traditional school. We developed a, uh, each classroom is, uh, is a flexible space. They would have, uh, <clears throat> I think, up to 30 kids in each classroom, but they would have three teachers with them. And uh, we developed these L-shaped classrooms. Each one of them had to have its own mud room because they were out in the field so much where they could take their gear off and come in. So each classroom has its own entryway. This is the second floor, so you can see there's a staircase over on the left-hand side that leads up to a mud room. And then there's an L-shaped classroom here, which allows uh, for great cross ventilation through the space, uh, which is a, a big bonus. Um, allows for a lot of daylight from the south side, a little bit of daylight um, from the north side of the space. I keep losing my cursor, I apologize as well as um, what you see here, this number five, these are called rotating room dividers. So we created these big 12 foot long um, closets essentially that pivoted on a big hinge. So the classroom could be set up as one big open L-shaped space or it could be divided into multiple configurations by the teachers depending on how they were using the spaces. You also see in the middle here, we have one classroom which is an art or science room in each space that, um, that's set up against the north side of the building. We tried to orient that in such a way that it was a narrower footprint because we weren't able to get the cross ventilation through those spaces. And so we're relying on one-sided daylighting and one-sided ventilation in those spaces. Um, and that's why we oriented them the way we did. Um, there's a look at the outside of the buildings once again. Um, interesting thing here in this, you know, war stories. Uh, you know, we designed all of these um, solar shading devices uh, with the big roofs to cut out the, the solar gain on the upper windows. Then we have um, the um, the, can the awnings, the, they're not light shelves. In any case, um, we're blocking the solar gain here with, um, with these aluminum devices right here. Uh, we're supposed to have light shelves on the inside of each of those uh, to help get more daylight penetration in this space. The owner built a few of them and they didn't like the way they looked. Um, they didn't like the way they looked on the inside of the space and so they only did it in a few of the rooms. So I don't actually have a picture of the spaces where they did them. <laughs> um, they're pretty low tech, pretty simple, but they just, they just thought they were too imposing in the classroom for some reason. And uh, we, did these, uh, we did these with actually a louvers um, grading, big issues with snow loading. They wanted the snow to be able to kind of fall through these, 
and not gather. It'll still gather somewhat up on these, but we also want some daylight to come through these. Is there a question over here or just a nodding head? Okay, good. Um, here's a picture inside the classroom. Um, it's really actually pretty phenomenal daylighting in these spaces, even without the light shelves. Um, the, I'm wondering, I don't know if this picture was taken before the sunscreen was installed, but there's a sunscreen right along there, as well as one at each of the windows at that level. And um, so the daylighting works real well in these spaces. Uh, the comfort wise, they work real well. And we're actually engaging a series of post occupancy evaluations right now in our buildings. And while this project chose not to pursue a LEED certification, um, our initial data shows that they're actually meeting uh, AIA 2030 guidelines, um, so they're, which means they're coming in at under less than 50% of the uh, typical energy use uh, for a structure like that, which is pretty, pretty impressive. So we, we're pretty pleased to hear that. David, could you talk about your, your the POE work that the community is getting involved in? Yeah, well, you know, that's kind of a holy grail on all this stuff. And where I think Green Design's met a lot of criticism is uh, following through and understanding how these things actually perform. I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir. Um, it's very rare that any of us in the professional industry side can get, can get money to do it. So we either do it because we care enough about it <laughs> and we want to kind of dedicate the time and energy, so to speak, to do it, or sometimes we can partner with organizations that can get grants to kind of make those studies happen. Typically the clients aren't all that interested in it, to be perfectly honest. They've done a huge capital campaign. They've raised as much money as they could possibly raise. They don't want to think about spending any more money for at least five or 10 years and because they're, they're worn out. <laughs> so in this case, we've taken on the initiative in-house. We've had some students choose to study some of our projects, and so we've gotten some good data out of the University of Washington, University of Oregon, on some of our projects post-occupancy. Um, but we've taken on our own initiative this year to actually study some of the projects ourselves. In fact, um, I could show you later, I have a little chart up, some preliminary results of what the energy use index is on some of these projects. A uh, tricky thing also is whether a lot of them aren't metered correctly. You guys know that story as well. <laughs> uh, for example, the Zoomasium project at Woodland Park Zoo, it's pr doing incredibly well in its gas usage, which provides most of the heating for the building. We can't get electrical data uh, because the zoo doesn't have individual electrical meters at the buildings. So they need to make a huge infrastructure investment at the zoo just so they can get the information to meter the individual buildings um, to then make smart decisions about how to kind of impact their use. So that, that's, a, that's a huge issue. And to be perfectly honest, most of these projects aren't designed with that in mind. Yes? Are those light fixtures stuck up between the beams and the ceiling? Yeah, they're, ac they're actually a... Uh, are they just work lights or something? Yeah, they're, they're a very uh, low budget light. They're kind of a triangular shape in section. There's glue lamp beams that are holding up the SIPs panels up there on the ceiling. And there's one of those on each side. They're, um, I believe they're, I don't know if they're T5s or T8 bulbs. And uh, they're just basically uh, shooting off in two directions. So there's another one on the other side of the beam that you actually don't see. Um, uh, very low budget, very low budget light fixtures in the project. <laughs> not, not my favorite light fixture of all time. Just <laughs> sure. I'll, I'll never use it again. Yeah. But thanks for bringing it up. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, here's a look at some of the windows. There you can actually see the sun, the sun screen there uh, through the window at that level. Um, there you can see the lights on, right? Yeah, yeah good, cool. And, um, and also just, uh, they had some rich benefactors. This project turned out one of, the, one of the benefactors of the project owned a solar panel facility, donated some uh, thin film solar panels, and we were able to wrap one of the buildings in a vertical application uh, with them towards the end of the project. And that's, that's the maintenance building, which has a, that's, it's a pretty small, it's about a four kilowatt uh, array on the building. Uh, just a picture. Solar, uh, photovoltaic, do they feed back into the grid? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they feed back in the grid, no batteries. And this, uh, you guys know all this because you live in snow country, but uh, the client was actually surprised, and they live in snow country, of how, um, how much more light they actually had because of the reflectivity of the snow in the spaces in the winter time than they did in the summer months. And that was, that was novel to them, and they've been living there their whole lives. But when the thing got built, they, it was really curious to them how bright it was in the winter in their spaces, and uh, that there was more contrast and it was darker in the summer months. So that was, you guys all know that story, right? Yeah. Anyway, I'm going to talk about one that's back out on the West Coast again, the Tulalip Administration Building. This is for the Tulalip Tribe, um, about 45 minutes north of Seattle. Um, this is a look down at Tulalip Bay. We've done a lot of work for the tribe, uh, a lot of large scale planning work for them, as well as a particular building, the administration building, which I'll talk about in a little more detail. 
Um, some of the planning work that we've done for the tribe focused in on uh, Tulela Bay, which is the heart of the tribe, um, where they're trying to get water quality up. We've done a lot of work with them on uh, strategies for changing development patterns um, around their riparian corridors to um, help, help improve the water, the water quality that's draining into Tulela Bay. They used traditionally the harvested shellfish there. They can't do that now because the water quality isn't good enough, so they have a long-term goal of being able to do that again. This is the traditional home of the tribe, kind of the heart of the tribe, but as many of you know, or if any of you have been out in our area, um, the Chilev tribe also has another center which is centered around a large casino resort along I-5, a very significant resort. So they kind of have this, they have this uh, kind of where, where is the heart of the tribe? The traditional heart is here, but the economic heart is in a different place. So we work with them in, a lot to help determine where facilities would go and what kind of development patterns would make sense for them in the future. Um, as part of that, just at the planning level, I wanted to throw a couple of these in there. We did a lot of work with them of looking at where you put some of the shared facilities, um, the community facilities, and what the impact would be on a miles-driven carbon impact. That's what that box at the bottom is, is a number of, that's a physical representation of pounds of carbon, uh, probably of tons of carbon, I believe, um, as well as the time wasted driving your car around in different patterns. So I believe this slide um, is showing if they clustered development patterns around the reservation, how that would impact um, all these issues. And this one here was showing that if they stuck with their traditional development patterns of having more dispersed functions uh, across the reservation, that the, uh, carbon, the carbon impact got bigger, people were wasting more time in their car. You can see at the upper hand side, they're wasting more gas. And so we're actually trying to do the math and show some of the numbers behind some of these things that we anecdotally kind of know are true. And also, I think a lot of work of trying to develop graphics that are easily communicated around these issues. And we're always messing around with them and experimenting with new ones, but these are just some examples um, from this project. Um, and this is another diagram here of looking where different, different functions could be. The bay is off on the left-hand side. The uh, casino resort is over on the right-hand side. Uh, the uh, Tulela Bay is down here. And these are all diagrams talking about how you clustered services. Right now, their administrative functions are broken up into, well, I think, 20 or 30 or 40 different spaces. So people are constantly driving all around the reservation to go collaborate with each other. And so it was a pretty visionary move um, to locate this new site near Tulalip Bay, near the heart of the tribe, and to bring all their administrative functions back together into a, basically an open office area uh, to about a 70,000 square foot building high-performing building on the bay. This is another project where we uh, put a weather station up. This is a, an example of one of those weather stations you can get. You can put a little computer chip in it and it records data. Um, over time, you can download it to your computer. Or you can take the chip out and uh, plug it into your computer and get real weather data. Particularly difficult for wind data because it's so specific from site to site. In this case, we thought it would be a very, very windy site and it turned out that the wind patterns that we got during one season weren't that strong and actually didn't warrant kind of what Kevin was bringing up before. Um, didn't warrant the use of uh, uh, wind turbines to generate energy. Um, but that was only one season. Ideally, you'd have that up there for five years so you could really understand. Um, just some tell how I'm doing on time. just want to make sure we're... About a half hour. Okay, good. Um, so this is a look, and the reason they chose this site is that it had views directly back down to the bay, which you can see here in this picture, and that's very important to have that connection. Uh, courtesy of IDL. <laughs> Uh, we did do a lot of daylighting studies on this building. Uh, the reason that picture back there shows you is that their big view, which is all about the complete heart of the tribe, was a due west view. And there was no way we were going to get around that. <laughs> we tried some schemes that faced north and south, um, but it was really important for as many people in the tribe as possible to have this direct visual connection, not only to this beautiful view, but to this view that they have so many stories associated with in the history of the tribe. So we had to work through that. Um, and we were partially successful and partially not successful. <laughs> um, so we, um, we worked real hard. You can see the model here is actually showing some exterior shading devices. Um, you can see we were working with some translucent shading devices up at the roof. We were working with some horizontal louvers to help block some of that low western sun. We also did a number of studies where we were looking at um, external uh, blinds, operable blinds on the outside of the building. We met with tribal council over and over and over trying to make the case on this. And we did, we did visual renderings inside the space. I don't have them with, with today. And they, they said, ah, it looks like we're working inside a prison. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't like having to look through louvers out at their view. They didn't even like the, the blinds that could come down. 
they were also pretty expensive and uh, they were worried about the maintenance issue on a big building like this. So we weren't able to do that. Uh, the best we would do is be able to use some high performance glazing and um, kind of do our best. So these are actually oriented with north up and you can see how these buildings do face, uh, these are just this is three levels of the building. Um, and some just simple low tech design solutions. We found quite often that when we're working in office environments that this kind of diagram makes a heck of a lot of sense. You can see we've got three essentially identifying the program pieces represented in this box, this box, and this box, which are the rooms that need to be in enclosed uh, rooms with doors, with acoustic separation, day, more daylight control, um, to try to gang all those functions together into some solid volumes, and then have our open office space uh, kind of in an area that's glazed on both sides, basically, um, here and open, open spaces here as well. So a very simple diagram to allow for cross ventilation in the spaces that we can get it, and then the spaces that are smaller where we can make single-sided ventilation or single-sided daylighting work, uh, we gang those together into more solid volumes. You'll see that in the building as we show you the picture. Here's a cross-section uh, going through uh, the main office area. Um, I think another clever thing we did here, as we were looking at the section of this building, um, you know, the ideal the ideal uh, office building, you want to get down to about 40 or 45 feet wide for really effective uh, daylighting. Um, you almost never can get down that skinny, at least in our experience, uh, just based on site issues and cost. We were able to get down, I think we're just under 60 feet wide in here, which is actually pretty good. Um, you can see the open office, the desks in the middle. Uh, but you notice in the section, you'll notice that the uh, middle floor is deeper, has a taller section than the upper floor. So the upper floor, we're able to get daylighting from both sides, but we're also able to get some skylights up on the roof to bring some daylight in through the middle of the spaces. We knew we weren't gonna be able to get cut atriums all the way down to the second floor. So we made the second floor, and I believe the first floor, a little bit taller, so we could get more daylight penetration into the space because we didn't have the benefit of the skylights down the middle. So just kind of a simple strategy of how we structured uh, the different floors. Uh, makes doing the stairs a little trickier, I guess, but other than that, there's really no extra cost in doing that. Um, but we do have high floor to floor on all these spaces um, to get effective daylighting working. You can see we've got as big of an overhang as we can to block some of that south-southwest sun. We're not able to do too much to block the due western sun. And you can see we're set up for, this is another mixed mode building where we have um, cross ventilation, natural ventilation uh, during uh, swing season months, but then we do have air conditioning. The windows can automatically shut down uh, when necessary during uh, uh, the heat of the summer. We tried real hard also to get, uh, to get uh, just pure uh, natural cooling going in this. And uh, we got some real funny responses. Uh, they just, it, wasn't, it just wasn't gonna happen. Here's the uh, view of the finished building, um, looking out towards the bay. You can see those big views out towards the bay. Um, and here's a view, we don't have a whole, this is I think the last picture of the project, but this is a view on the upper area, looking at the open office area. You can see some of the skylights in the middle of the space, bringing daylight down into the middle of the space. Um, you can see, and we basically just ended up with, uh, looks like pretty inexpensive blinds on the inside to deal with glare when that became an issue. Um, and so it was a pretty low tech solution there. Open office, uh, we had a discussion at lunchtime today about um, open office. And when, we, when clients move to an open office scheme, they always wanna kind of push those partitions up high. We found there's actually a lot of benefits in using the space to have the partitions down lower. Um, gives you more access to views from more of the desks. It also gives you kind of a more, I believe, a, in some ways more of a sense of privacy because you know when someone's sitting next to you and when you don't. So if you pick up the phone, usually there's no one sitting next to you and you can actually have a normal conversation. You have to worry about it. When you're sitting in a, with these six foot walls on either side of you, you don't know if anyone's there. And so you, you have to look around. You have to hope that no one's snuck in there while you're having your phone call. And so you don't really have a sense of who's around you and who's not. We have a very open office in Methuen. We find that more effective this way. Um, there's a view of the outside. That's our, Pretty dramatic view up there. The tribal council chambers are up there on that upper level and kind of look right back out over the bay. Um, I'm just gonna motor through some of these because I'm gonna run out of time. Um, just talk about some cool strategies. This is a low income housing, pro affordable income, ho affordable housing project up on uh, Lopez Island called the Lopez Island Land Trust. Series of I think 16 or 18 units, can't remember how many units. Um, uh, single family residential but attached. Uh, set up in a meadow in a little field up on near the main town on Lopez Island near the village um, with a goal of being net zero energy use. 
uh, didn't pursue lead, but did pursue a net zero energy goal, and is actually achieving that in some of the units. It's dependent on how the people actually operate these units on an individual basis, and how well they perform. You can see the buildings are set up mostly in an east-west direction to take advantage of solar gain. Um, so we have a lot of low-tech solutions, but we also have some of the higher-tech solutions like photovoltaics and solar hot water panels. Uh, here's a look at the project built. I think it finished construction about a year ago. Um, Another cross-section here, when this talks about all about these low-tech strategies, they were interested in using some straw bale construction. We thought it was most intelligent to use the straw bale on the north side of the buildings where we had the most insulation needs. So the straw bale you can see in the images on the left-hand side of the page. Um, high windows, low windows for ventilation, um, a trellis to block some of the, uh, day, uh, some of the daylight penetration, that we, the sun penetration that we don't want. Um, um, Well-insulated buildings, very simple, very low-tech. And the people who are operating their buildings and turning off the light switches, I believe they're all metered individually so people can actually compete a little bit with each other. And I think that's another very clever and uh, smart, uh, interesting thing to do. A lot of people make fun of LEED and other green building programs. They say, oh, people are just competing to get points. And that's not pure. You know, why are, that's, you know people are just chasing points to, to get a gold or a platinum or something like that. But, you know, all of us, it's a, a competition is a basic human emotion. All of us have it. Some of us have more than others, obviously. Um, but I, I think it's pretty clever of LEED, and one of the reasons LEED's been so successful is it actually harnesses that basic human instinct and leverages it for people to do good in the world. And so I think it's actually a very clever system in that way. And uh, when you can meter things individually and have people compete against each other, see who's using the least energy in their house. It's like those websites now where people are trying to drive their Prius, and see if they can get like 95 miles an hour. That's a little bit dangerous because people don't actually hit the brakes. They just kind of cruise around corners. Um, but in any case, uh, that, that kind of competition, I think, has actually been real healthy uh, for the green building industry, and that's why we've seen so much success. Um, just a couple more views of the Lopez project. Just a sweet little project. Pretty low budget, too. You know, I think in the maybe $150, $160 square foot range. Um, they have their own gardens, uh, pea patches. Uh, and the community got out and built a lot of the straw bale infrastructure themselves. So there's a lot of kind of ownership in these, in these units. And so there's a real, real sense of community out there. Um, yeah, that's just a nice picture. <laughs> uh, Miraval is a, uh, we, I just, we went from uh, probably one of the least expensive projects to one of the most expensive ones. <laughs> this is one of the pictures I showed earlier on. Just another way of looking at um, low tech, um, load reduction strategies. This is out in Tucson, Arizona. It's actually a very high end resort. Um, if you watch the Oprah show, she hangs out there a lot. It's one of her favorite places to go. Um, they don't really have particularly nice facilities, or they didn't until now, uh, but they have great programs there, all about mindfulness <coughs> and confidence building and um, issues like that. Uh, and the reason I'm showing this is just this, we have some great images of the, of the uh, rammed earth construction that was done there. That was a way to create a sense of beauty and connection to the land, but also a way to get high thermal mass in the buildings. Um, so we were able to use the soils on site, um, gather them on site, build formwork. I don't know if any rammed earth is going on out here or not, but. Um, uh, Actually, I just had a quick, quick yeah. question about that. Would you find that the process and the cost of doing the rammed earth wall would be much less than concrete or um, uh, greater? No, I don't believe it would be much less than concrete typically. Kind of comparable? I cast in place probably pretty comparable to cast in place concrete. You know, it depends. If you do it like a real mom and pop operation and people build their own house, you can kind of make it a do-it-yourself thing. You experiment, you mix it, you mix in some cement, and you see how it goes. Getting a contractor to do it is a little bit trickier, and so I'm guessing they didn't save any money over cast-in-place concrete on this. Um, certainly saved some embodied energy because all this stuff is coming from the land, so saved a lot of embodied energy. Um, so uh, kind of compacting it, jackhammering it down in lifts, um, and really creating some kind of gorgeous walls with a strong kind of emotional connection to the land. Um, these are all lead, uh, I can't remember if they're lead silver or lead gold buildings, uh, uh, but so super high performing buildings. Uh, you can tell it's a nice resort because those beds look awfully comfy, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the interior designer is actually out of New York City. And uh, you can see, get a sense of how that, uh, this strategy and that connection to the land with those walls, how effective it was of connecting the user um, to the site. And you see how well those walls are done in beautiful lifts, kind of moving on up. No, they're not finished. No finish, just the formwork. <clears throat> There's enough cement that you can't yeah. pick away at it. Yeah, yeah, basically you're just taking um, cement 
no aggregate, you're taking cement, you're taking the soil, you have to test the soil to make sure it's gonna work. You can't have too much, um, too much organics in it, I believe. And uh, I believe they add a little bit of water, not too much, but a little bit of water, and they compact it in lifts, one level at a time. But you can see the lifts on the wall. You can see they're doing about a foot at a time, kind of moving on up the wall. In the southwest, they're really the experts at it. Not too much of it going on in the northwest, to be perfectly honest. Um, the other use here was with some locally made adobe bricks. Um, so another uh, kind of low embodied energy product used in the project. So a very kind of low tech thing, but done in a very elegant way. Um, I, the climate, I think, could work okay. What you got to balance out is these walls are not insulated. <laughs> um, and so you have to, you'd have to study whether that makes sense or not. So you get, all the, you get all the thermal benefit of the mass without any insulation between the internal space and the mass. Um, but I'm guessing in order to meet energy codes, <laughs> um, in order to meet some of your performance guidelines, you, people might want you to insulate the exterior wall. We've done some concrete before where you're trying to get the mass exposed to the inside. Uh, we did a winery in the Seattle area where we did tilt up concrete panels that have um, insulation in between, so it's kind of a sandwich panel. So that's always the big dilemma is uh, our engineers want to get as much of the thermal mass as they can exposed to the interior of the space. Uh, and we want to expose it visually too, but then we have a hard time figuring out where to put the insulation. So probably not going to work so well here if you want to expose it on the outside and the inside. That's my guess. Um, Pier 56 is our space. Uh, that's what it looked like a long time ago. We renovated an old warehouse on the waterfront of Seattle. Um, welcome you all to visit. That's the grand opening of Methuen. Right? <laughs> uh, we're not that old. Uh, in any case, we, we took this space, we, we leased the space. Uh, we were able to work with the landlord to take an old warehouse space like this on the waterfront. Didn't really have too many windows in the space. Um, get a lot of windows in the space, um, set it up and take advantage of the location and the shape of the building. Um, for uh, natural cooling um, and for pretty effective daylighting, although there's some changes we'd really like to make to kind of tune it up and make it perform better. You know, we're situated down on the Elliott Bay, so we do have some cool breezes. Um, it still does get pretty hot in there. We hit 103 degrees in Seattle last summer in the all-time record, and it was pretty hot in there. <laughs> in fact, it was really hot. <laughs> um, but we, we're pretty casual there. We can dress casually, so it's okay. Um, you see, we can take advantage of the shape of the building with windows down low, windows up high to get cross ventilation going. Um, and we have a completely open office environment. That's kind of what it looks like. Um, and as uh, so you can see, we're, we're real open. Uh, everyone's just kind of working on doors, classic architect style. And um, we have some pretty spectacular views out to the west. Here we have a benefit in that our west facing elevation, which we have a big view, is the narrow side of the building. So the building's oriented real nicely in an east-west direction, and the big views are out to the west. One of our things we'd like to add here as we tune the building up would be some external blinds on the building, because we do get some pretty uncomfortable daylight penetration um, during certain times of the year, uh, especially when it's clear like that. And uh, some other things we've discovered is we'd like to, we have a lot of dark ceilings in the space. Um, Folks would like us to you know, put some white panels, perhaps get some better daylight, some more skylights. We have some areas in the office that are a little bit darker. You can't quite tell. This space is real way, well daylight there. But you can see off to the right-hand side of the picture where the roof comes down low. There's some areas that are a little bit darker and could use some better daylight um, use. The other thing is it's a leaky building. And um, so as we had some post-occupancy evaluations done on our space, it's not performing as well as it should. And uh, one is that the boiler is not a real high efficiency boiler that's providing our heat, so that's one issue. So we'd like to switch over to a condensing boiler. Um, the other issue is that we believe the building is real leaky. We haven't been able to figure out a way to do a blower door test on a 33,000 square foot um, <laughs> office space. Um, but anecdotally, we know spaces that leak, and so we, we really need to get the work together and uh, come up with the funds to seal this thing up so we're not uh, losing our conditioned air in the wintertime. Um, Here's a look in at some of those window operators, kind of old-fashioned. These are not on motors. These are the old-fashioned window cranks. Um, so this is more like a sailboat. <laughs> you got to get in there. You got to trim the sails. You got to make this thing work over time to make it perform. So, uh, but that's kind of part of our culture, and we like that. Anybody manufacture that still? Yeah, yeah, I believe you can still get these, unless you know, unless you think they went out of business in the last year. They're around. Um, Baxter, no, I can't remember the name, Dayton, Dayton Industries, D-A-Y-T-O-N. We get phone calls all the time about this. The Yesler project had these same ones in it, but we actually had motors put on them. 
They're really well built, but they're kind of bulky and clunky. They're not the most elegant things in the world. You have to kind of plan ahead of how all these pipes and fittings all kind of fit into your space. Um, but they're, if you have a kind of more industrial kind of space, they seem to fit in real well. We've used them a lot. Um, there's a low-tech solution. There's one of our office bicycles. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'm just real quickly, and just this is the last thing I have in here, just because this is a fun thing. And someone asked me about biophilia earlier today. This is an area that we've done a lot of research in. Biophilia doesn't have, the study of biophilia doesn't have too much to do directly with kind of energy sustainability, but it does have to do with the last part which I wanted to leave you on, which is the subject of making sure that we're creating beautiful places for our communities that people are going to love, take care of, and maintain over time. And um, so we've done a bunch of research in collaboration with um, Stephen Keller at Yale University, uh, Judy Heerwagen out of the University of Washington. Um, basically, the, the, the biophilia principle, so to speak, it's not biomimicry, which is something else that a lot of people mix it up with. Biophilia, um, and I'm not going to do this justice because I'm not an expert. My understanding of it is, is that as human beings, we are wired with certain things that we're attracted to and certain things we're kind of repulsed by. <laughs> and that's basically in our DNA, and it's based on our evolution of how we evolved as human beings um, in Central Asia, in Africa, and our life as early humans. And there's certain things that are hardwired into us. It's so like, like, let's think about it. Why, why are people up on, I'll just use Lake Coeur d'Alene. Why, why is a piece of property on Lake Coeur d'Alene that's waterfront worth probably 10 to 20 times more than a similar piece of property that's you know, one mile inland from there? You know, what is it about all humans that are attracted to that spot? Well, you know, way, way, way back when, I mean, that was where your source of food was. That was where your source of transportation was. That's not why anyone wants it now. Right now we look at it and we think it's beautiful. Why is that? It's because certain of these things are hardwired into us. Why are we attracted to moving water and we're kind of freaked out a little bit or not real attracted to still stagnant water? Well, stagnant water probably didn't have real healthy fish for us to eat, uh, but the moving water typically did have um, healthy water for us to drink, um, healthy um, food for us to harvest in that area. So there's lots of things like that that are hardwired into our bodies, and there's a lot of research going on in this area. So with the research that we've done is not around biophilia as a general principle. It's around how biophilia relates to physical design of spaces. And uh, Bert Gregory, the president of our firm, helped co-author a chapter um, in a book on biophilia recently with Judy Heerwagen. And we developed what we call a seven attributes of nature that we are inherently attracted to. And these are things we try to look to in our designs. And um, when we see design that we like, very typically it has all these things in it in one level or another. And we've also noticed that when we're working on designs, if we feel like it's not working out so well, we're sometimes we're missing some of these things. So here's some of the key things, um, the seven attributes. Uh, number one is motion. Uh, humans are attracted to things that move. That's that kind of moving water principle, and that's why we showed this slide. Sensory richness, um, light, smells, touch, tactile senses. Those are stimulating things that, we, that we're attracted to, as long as they're good senses. <laughs> um, the idea of serendipity. Um, how many designs do you love when you're, you're going through and there's a pattern and a, something that you're moving through that's, you know, there's kind of a rhythm, there's a rigor of the structure, and then you go discover something that you didn't expect around the corner, and it just kind of brings joy to you. That's that idea of serendipity, as de demonstrated by this slide. Um, sense of resilience, durability and resilience. We're attracted to things that seem resilient. Um, sense of freeness, uh, not feeling constrained, but sense of openness and freeness. Uh, variations on a theme. This is a tricky one, but if you think about, if you want to move, if you think about a, in a building sense of having kind of a rigorous grid within a, but, but if, it's, if it's so rigorous and there's never any variations on kind of how that works, it gets monotonous and boring, it doesn't feel right, it feels almost stifling. Uh, if you think about in an urban design context, um, you can have a lot of repetition, but you need some change within that to kind of bring that sensory richness about. That's why you don't want one architect designing all the buildings in the city. Um, the last one, uh, the idea of prospect and refuge, and that's kind of the idea that we like to kind of find spaces like this like this eel where we feel protected and we're huddled up where we have a sense of prospect. So uh, no one can get us, <laughs> but we have, good, we have a good sense of what's going on out there. And that's kind of wired in us. Uh, if you picture 
picture guys back on the plains in Africa thousands of years ago and uh, where they would find shelter um, in places just like this. Maybe not holed up in a tree, but in a place where no one could get us from behind <laughs> and we could have a good prospect out on the landscape. So anyway, when all that stuff comes together, <laughs> um, and you know it when you feel it, you can really create beautiful, beautiful places that you're all proud of. So anyway, I just wanted to leave on that because I don't want to just talk about the techie energy stuff. I want to make sure that all that stuff, so we don't have a repeat of the 1970s when we were doing energy efficient buildings, that people didn't really um, uh, embrace the way they looked. Um, ideally, in this movement of sustainability, this bigger movement, um, we're all doing projects that are just absolutely stunning and beautiful and perform at the highest possible level at the same time. So anyway, that's, uh, that's the end of this. So thanks. <laughs> I, I, I went a little bit longer than I thought, but there's still a few minutes for questions, and I, my flight's not for a while, so you can ask me questions as long as you want. Great presentation, oh, David. And so uh, we'll just turn it over for a few questions then. Um, if you have a question, raise your hand. I can bring around the mic and Oops. All right. Well, that's there aren't any questions, then thank you for coming. And again, thanks to our sponsors. Uh, Northwest Energy, Idaho Power. Um, we'll see you for the next uh, lecture series in the spring. Thanks.